Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Judges chapters 7 and 8, the famous story of Gideon here. And we see in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, that twice the Lord narrowed down Gideon's forces to ensure that Israel would not be able to believe in their own strength, but would rather trust in the Lord for victory over their enemies. And these 300 men that uh, lap water like dogs, they may have been the least refined of the group, but they were certainly the minority, and that was why God chose them for the battle, so that Gideon's army would be as small as possible to ensure that God got the glory for the victory. In verses 9 through 18 of chapter 7, we see that the Lord graciously provided reassurance to his weak need servant Gideon through a dream provided to and interpreted by a pair of Midianites in their camp that Gideon snuck up on. And this invigorated Gideon to continue with his unorthodox plan of battle involving trumpets and torches, uh, one that he clearly had in mind since chapter 7, verse 8, when you read there, it says that the soldiers that left the group of 300 actually handed their trumpets over to the remaining men. Trumpets and torches in the depths of the night were going to confuse the enemy and make them think they were surrounded by a superior host. And in verses 19 through 25, that's what we see. That confusion dooms the Midianite camp. See, normal armies would have one trumpet and one torch for many numbers of soldiers. And this makes the groggy Midianites in the middle of the watch of the night confused, afraid that they're going to be surrounded or that they are by a superior enemy. And what's more, the Lord divinely intervened he caused the Midianites to kill one another in the midst of their confusion and terror. The author of the book of Judges making it very clear, most likely Samuel that wrote this, but making it very clear that it was the Lord who caused the victory. And then Gideon reaches out to men from the tribes of Naphtali and Asher and Manasseh and Ephraim to chase after the fleeing enemy forces who are now just led by the remaining two kings instead of the two military leaders that were already uh, or that are chased after, excuse me, and are then put to death. And and in chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, Gideon wisely convinces the Ephraimites, uh, who got to help take down the Midianite leaders, that that was better than being involved in the battle from the beginning. But then this judge turns right around and shows some foolishness, right? There's a, a vindictiveness that he brings out in threatening the leaders of Succoth and Penuel for not immediately helping his army out. And certainly the leaders of those cities were in the wrong, but they were no more afraid and doubtful than Gideon himself had been when the Lord called upon him. The Lord had showed him grace. Gideon ought to have shown those men grace at this time as well and simply answered them and said, if you give us bread, it'll help us defeat these Midianite kings even quicker. In chapter 8, verses 10 through 21, God does give total victory over the Midianites to get in his men. Indeed, an impressive victory here. We see 300 men. They probably have been armed by this point, and they fall upon 15,000 Midianites to kill them. Uh, then Gideon keeps his uh, vindictive promise to Succoth and Penuel. He disciplines the leaders of Succoth for, uh, with thorns and briars, probably embedded into whips, and he kills all the men of Penuel. And it's interesting that Gideon was quick to kill his own people, Israelites living in those two cities of Succoth and Penuel, but he was wanting to relegate the putting to death of the Midianite kings to his own son before being convinced by them to do otherwise. In chapter 8, verses 22 through 27, we see another example of conflicting wisdom by Gideon. We've been seeing this, right? He trusts the Lord, then he doesn't trust the Lord. He he gives, you know, he, he uh, has some wisdom that he expresses to the tribe of Ephraim, but then he shows foolishness in how he deals with other Israelites. Here we have wisdom on one hand. He rejects becoming the ruler of Israel. He points to God rightly and not man as the leader of his people. But then on the other hand, what does he do? He goes and makes himself an aphid, which remember, only the high priest was supposed to wear such an item. And sure enough, this aphid becomes the object of idolatry for Gideon and his family. Very sad indeed. Uh, also sad is the postscript to this time, chapter 8, verses 28 through 35. We see a good thing, 40 years of peace, but then some very bad things. One is Gideon having many wives, producing 70 sons and who knows how many daughters. Remember, God intended one woman for every man. Otherwise, he would have given Adam multiple wives, and uh, in, Jesus would not have affirmed that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, singular, a man, singular, his wife, and the two singulars shall become one singular 
flesh, Matthew 19, 6. But the result of Gideon's sin and taking on all of these wives and concubines are so many children that are going to prove to be very troublesome, especially Abimelech, son of a concubine in Shechem. There's going to be some terrible consequences brought about with him in chapter 9 of Judges. And notice, and this, this, the text says it clearly, as soon as Gideon died, Israel did what? Entered another cycle of disobedience, making a particular Baal, their god, Baal Berith, and forgetting about Yahweh entirely. Some principles and application we can learn from these two chapters. One is to beware selfish ambition, that selfish ambition that Gideon fell prey to. He did resist becoming ruler of his people, but he did create that aphod, and that clearly became a huge stumbling block for his people. Remember what James 3.16 says, Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. We should be content to be unknown by the people of this world, unknown by future generations as anything but just a follower of Christ. Let's make Christ known instead of our own names. Another principle we see how quickly, oh, how quickly idolatry can spring up in the hearts of men and women. John Calvin said rightly <laughs> that the heart is like a factory of idols, right? An idol factory, and it just kind of comes along. Remember, anything that is more important to you than God is an idol. Anything that you spend more time and effort on than the Lord is a strong indication of idolatry. Anything you're willing to sin for or willing to sin because you didn't get is an idol. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 14, after Paul reminds the Corinthians of the sin of the Israelites, including idolatry, he says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Remember, it's not our ability that causes us to uh, be able to resist temptation. It's the Lord through us. As we gaze upon him, as we grow in Christ's likeness, we will resist temptation. What does he say? verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 10, right after that, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. That's the way of escape. That's the way to, to endure that temptation is to flee idolatry. We need to apply that to our lives today. And, and that begins with trusting the Lord for victory, for victory over sin, over death, over Satan, just as he provided the victory over the Midianites to Gideon and his men. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57, one of the best chapters in the entire Bible. When this perishable our flesh today will have put on the imperishable, which is the glorification of our bodies that the Lord promises to all those who are in Christ Jesus. And this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that far surpassing victory that is found in Christ alone? Have you turned from your sin? Have you repented today and trusted in Jesus Christ? Is this true? If not, do so today and do so every day uh, that we would not just cease repenting, but that we would live repentant lifestyle, constantly trusting in the Lord uh, as both the author of our salvation and the one who we have victory over daily sinful desires, daily idolatrous desires. And, and the death that is to come us, and of course, the evil one, Satan, who seeks to tempt us. Well, this has been Judges chapters 7 and 8, and I do hope you have a great day.